So we are absolutely honored to have Andrew Hershkowitz, who is the Power Africa and Trade Africa Coordinator, as well as Dr. Alan Isendra, who is the USAID Energy Division Chief with us this evening. So this summer, President Barack Obama announced Power Africa, which is a major initiative that seeks to double access to power in Sub-Saharan Africa by 2030. So with, the, with this announcement, it really heightened the attention on Africa's energy challenges. I think importantly, um, uh, Power Africa is based in Nairobi, Kenya. And tonight, Alan and Andy are going to give an overview of Power Africa. Thereafter, Dr. Rob Stoner will guide us through a discussion session. And then we'll open it up for Q&A. So I now want to bring up Professor Ignacio Perez Arriaga, who's going to talk a little bit about Power Africa in the context of energy for human development, and then he will also formally introduce our guests. So, Ignacio. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, thank you very much, Sarah and Yael, um, and the rest of the D4 development uh, team for making this event happening. Uh, it's really important for us here at the university uh, to have a direct contact with this uh, major initiative, Power Africa, uh, that will deploy on the field in Africa um, important economic and technical resources with a very significant volume uh, to serve uh, economic growth and the needs of poor people at the basis of the uh, development pyramid. Um, thank you very much, uh, Andy and Alan, for being here uh, with us presenting Power Africa and Trade Africa. Uh, I will, um, in the seven minutes that I've been given, instead of bringing my typical 200 slides, uh, let me uh, follow some notes that I have to introduce the topic of the day by highlighting some basic facts and, uh, and ideas. So first of all, the figures of energy poverty. Um, today we are talking about energy access and economic growth in developing countries. Let me repeat then the figures that everybody in this planet should know by heart. Um, there is a huge disparity, as you know, in energy use. Roughly the poorer three quarters of the world's population use only 10% of the world's energy. And although many countries and communities have made improvements during the last decades, uh, still 1.4 billion people live without any electricity, and 2.4 million people have to cook and heat their houses with low-quality biomass that they have to collect every day thanks to. Uh, 4,000 people die every day because they breathe polluted air from cooking stoves inside poor living communities. Um, so, uh, Sarah was talking about energy and human development. This is the, you see the logo that we have in our group. Um, emphasizes the relationship between human development and energy. It is widely accepted that the lack of access to energy services is a fundamental obstacle to human, social, and economic development. And the provision of reliable, secure, and affordable energy services is central to addressing many of today's development uh, problems, uh, including poverty, inequality, climate change, food security, health, and education. By human development, um, as in the logo of our group, we understand not only economic growth that typically is associated to um, um, GDP, um, per capita gross national product, but also other metrics that are more directly associated to people's welfare. And these are life expectation, provision of basic services, quality of governance, women rights, or level of technological development. The dimension of the problem. Well, um, here we are talking not only of providing a couple of uh, high efficiency lights and connection, I mean, or charging uh, the phone. Uh, energy access should not be pursued only as an end in itself, uh, it must be aligned with the growth of sustainable demand for those services. 
and the, the world's poor need more than a token supply of electricity. The goal should be to provide the power necessary to boost productivity and raise living standards. And therefore, energy access should not be addressed in isolation uh, to provide basic electricity, but as part of a wider poverty reduction approach. I understand that uh, Power Africa is meant to uh, produce economic growth at all levels in the population. Energy access is not simply about supplying electricity for lighting or improved cook stoves to those living in deplorable conditions, although this is critical. Uh, to promote economic development and growth, these energy services need to be put to productive uses that support income generation and help empower local entrepreneurs. What are the challenges? Well, the obstacles to widespread energy access, and specifically electricity access, are very well known. Financing, planning, governance, human capacity building, and they are not trivial to overcome. Adoption and design of adequate technologies well adapted to its circumstance are not trivial tasks, and the solutions must be compatible with local culture and participation of the local communities and adapted to their specific resources, internal organization, and to ensure sustainability. Technology is important, but it's just one among several major factors that are necessary to achieve a sustainable improvement in welfare of those communities. In most cases, there is also a significant lack of effective institutions, good business models, transparent governance, and appropriate regulation in place. Why Africa? Well, I am not in President Barack Obama's mind, but uh, I think that Sub-Saharan Africa poses the most difficult challenges to achieving universal energy access. Despite an abundance of commercial energy resources, electric power systems in Africa have been very slow to develop, and 32% of the population, 585 million people, in Sub-Saharan Africa remain without access to electricity. Most of the least electrified countries in the world are located in Sub-Saharan Africa, 17 out of the 20 least electrified countries in the world. For example, 97% of the population in Burundi, the Liberia or Chad, or 95% of Rwanda, Central African Republic, or Sierra Leone lack electricity access. Uh, the carbon access to eliminate energy poverty are falling short both in terms of scale and pace. In fact, if the carbon trends continue, more people in Africa will be without access to modern energy services in 2030 than today, according to uh, distinguished uh, institutions and, uh, that have published reports on the topic. Um, a shortage of generation capacity is not only the last mile the connection to the end users. Uh, generation capacity has been a significant barrier to power sector development. Uh, the new investments in capacity have not been able to keep pace with rapid demand growth. Just to have an idea, uh, the amount of gigawatts uh, connected in South Africa and Africa in, in generation is 34. Uh, if we exclude South Africa, and Argentina has 20. So all these countries are slightly more than what Argentina as a stall capacity in generation. The effects of climate change also pose an additional challenge for the large number of African countries that rely very heavily on hydropower. Well, any good news? Well, <laughs> there are hopeful signs that the situation might change for the better. Um, in the World Energy Outlook of the International Energy Agency in 2010-2011, the special chapters were devoted to at universal energy access, so indicating a new interest in the energy community on this topic. Uh, energy companies and large foundations have initiated studies, some of which we are developing now here at MIT. Um, uh, in, in 2010, the United Nations Secretary General Advisory Group on Energy and Climate Change put forth the goal of achieving sustainable energy for all with a 2030 target of providing universal access to modern energy services. Supporting this goal, the United Nations General Assembly declared last year as the International Year for Sustainable Energy for All. As an answer to this call, in 2012 also, the President of the European Commission announced the commitment of the European Union to contribute to take care of one-third of the universal access problem by 2030. 
although not much activity has been seen so far. In contrast with this kind of long-term commitments, Power Africa initiative announced by President Obama last summer is meant to deploy in the short term significant economic and technical resources in sub-Saharan Africa. This is what our guests will be telling us about now. So I'll stop talking now so our guests uh, to take the floor. Uh, first of all, uh, and we'll, we have here is um, uh, Sarah Hussein, Andrew Heskovic, who is the coordinator for President Barack Obama Power Africa and Trade Africa Initiatives. Prior, prior to this appointment, he served as USAID Mission Director in Ecuador and also as Deputy Mission Director in Peru and uh, as USAID Supervisory Regional Legal Advisor for Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru. So I guess that you could give your presentation in Spanish. <laughs> also, for five years, Andy acted as the Regional Legal Advisor for the Caribbean, providing services to Barbados, the Dominican Republic, Guyana, Haiti, and Jamaica. And uh, he joined USAID in 2001. Now, Allen Eisenbrath is the Energy Division Chief of USAID Office for Energy and Infrastructure. His work focuses on water and power sector reform and infrastructure regulation. Since 2004, he has assisted the development of a regional electricity market in Central Asia and commercialization of power utilities in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Haiti. Prior to joining USAID in 2004, Dr. Eisenbrand worked for Deloitte Emerging Markets in the Washington, D.C. Utilities and Infrastructure Division. Yours is the excited about the opportunity to come and address all of you because this is the toughest crowd that I've had to address yet because you're people who actually know what you're talking about when you talk about energy. I'm used to dealing with the Washington crowd. Everybody thinks they know what they're talking about and they kind of jump on the bandwagon and I'm one of those people who's jumped on the bandwagon. He revealed to you that I'm a lawyer, I'm not a technical person. But the secret that people don't know is I was always a very much a technical person. I'm regretting right now that I didn't go to MIT instead of going to Georgetown. Although I did love Georgetown, and probably because I went to Georgetown, I'm doing what I'm doing now because I got involved in the Foreign Service, and I'm able to be able to work with the government to try to advance this presidential initiative. That being said, I realize what the importance, how important it is for us to be reaching out to academia getting your input. And so one thing as I talk, I'm going to give you a general overview of Power Africa. But I also want you to be thinking about if you had designed Power Africa, or if you were to be asked to design Power Africa, how you would have gone about doing it. And I want to have very much a conversation. In fact, Alan told me he's not going to say anything because he wants to get the question from you all. It's also a reflection of the fact that he's a technical person, I think, and less comfortable speaking. And if I got a technical route, I'd be silent and he'd be doing the talking probably. But he's also my crush because he's a technical person who really has worked in the sector and the industry for years. So I know what I don't know. And then I want you to think about what are we doing right and what are we doing wrong. And I, I tend to be very transparent and very open about this. And I also, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you a little about what Power Africa is and what Power Africa is not. So Power Africa started, really sort of evolved about a year ago from a trip that the current uh, US trade representative, Mike Froman, at the time was a deputy national security advisor, had taken with some interagency colleagues to Africa, to sub-Saharan Africa, and they were observing what they saw as the key constraints to growth in these countries that were enjoying very rapid economic growth. And what they saw all, all around them, and I saw it recently as soon as I arrived, was big, expensive, dirty diesel generators that were making companies non-competitive. And they identified this key constraint to growth as preventing the continued growth and also preventing people from emerging from the middle class and saw it 
that some will potentially choke the country. So for a variety of development reasons and economic reasons, something that needs to be addressed immediately. Similarly, members of uh, the, the Hill staff, of, of uh, Capitol Hill staff, also went on similar terms, both Republicans and Democrats alike. And they saw the exact same thing. So at the same time, while President Obama was planning the Power Africa Initiative, on Capitol Hill, we've seen the Electrify Africa Act that's been introduced and with bipartisan support. So everyone sort of reached consensus. A lot of them happened to visit the same countries and saw the same issues. Power Africa is focusing in six countries right now. The countries are Kenya, Tanzania, Ghana, Ethiopia, Liberia, and Nigeria. And there really wasn't a lot of science into selecting those countries. It wasn't like the Millennium Challenge Corporation where they have a scorecard and they look at different factors. It really was a convergence of people who, based on a lot of anecdotal uh, evidence and also looking at statistics, decided these are countries where we have potentials for good partnership, but for different reasons. But if you look at Ethiopia, Ethiopia is a country where they never had an independent power producer. They've never done a, a, a power purchasing agreement with the private sector. So there was a real opportunity with incredible geothermal resources to try to transform that sector. There's different constraints. You look at Liberia. Liberia's got 23 megawatts of electricity generation right now. I think back in 1980, they had something like 400 megawatts or something along the way, like 300. So they're really a, there's, a, there's a significant deficit and there are people within Monrovia, even though officially they've got 23 megawatts on the grid, there's a pastor <coughs> in Liberia who I, I think pro provides power to thousands of Liberians in Monrovia through diesel generators that people pay and he hooks it up. So there's all kinds of needs for solutions. And then you've got Nigeria, and Alan's a real expert in Nigeria, where USAID and other US government agencies have been working for years to try to create the proper enabling environment so the private sector investment would come in. And we're now at that critical point. And if you look, I think about two weeks ago, the very first privatizations took place. And I think two to 4,000 megawatts of electricity are now in private or will soon to be completely privatized, but largely for work that the US government has been contributing to significantly. So even though we can take credit for that as a Power Africa success, it's work that Alan's been working on for over a decade. So, so Power Africa is learning from all the things that 12 different US government agencies have been doing and that we're going to continue to do. And looking at the tools that we have in our toolbox right now, to look at large energy transactions that are either currently in the pipeline or that potentially could come on, you know, could, could come on track, and figuring out what can we do either remove the obstacles that would prevent these transactions from coming online or to expedite them in some way. And it's looking at the 12 agencies are Department of State. Sometimes the most effective way to move something forward is have the US ambassador go in and meet with the president and say, this minister is not handling this properly. You need to make sure that he pushes forward on the energy legislation that's key to ensuring that there's private sector investment. So you've got the State Department that plays two roles. They've got the political role, but then the state also has the Bureau of Energy Resources, which has incredible expertise, um, technical expertise, on regulatory management and other all sorts of policy issues. You've got USAID, which does sort of the traditional, um, we have we provide technical expertise. Um, we will hire experts. I think there are probably people in this room who probably work on USAID contracts when there's a specific, a specific need that we can send someone in to provide advice on gas regulatory policy or advice on grid codes or advice on wind intermittency issues to, or, or hiring legal counsel. So we're the sort of the traditional grant agency. We also have um, financing mechanisms. You've got the Overseas Private Investment Corporation that provides loans and loans get loan guarantees and risk insurance for U.S. companies or at least companies that have some U.S. interest to make sure that there's financing for these deals to move forward. You've got the Export-Import Bank, which also provides financing to U.S. companies. So if GE wants to sell turbines that are produced in the United States for a hydro plant, 
it can it, it, it can take advantage of. It may not be GE. It may be a small solar company, and we're working with a solar company right now, and also a smart grid company that has not done these investments before, but because of the, the XM financing, it'll help them get what they need to actually make the investments. You've got the Millennium Challenge Corporation. You've got the Department of Commerce that is going to reach out to U.S. companies because a big part of Power Africa, it's not just about bringing online more electricity, but it's also creating jobs and creating partnerships uh, for Americans as well. You've got the uh, U.S. African Development Foundation, which is a very small U.S. government agency. It has a budget of, I think, of less than $30 million a year. And they just launched their, their off-grid challenge. And they're catering to the really small off-grid communities. So if there's a farmer that has some agricultural solution that would involve a solar-powered windmill, for example, he can come in and ask for a grant for $5,000, $50,000, whatever it might be. And their grant application is actually just closed. So, But I talked to the head of USADF the other day, and she's really excited. They're limiting it to Nigeria and Kenya for now. They got a lot of applications for that. Um, you've got the Department of Treasury, which has its overseas advisors as well. You've got the Department of Energy, obviously, which has all kinds of technical expertise. And we're getting ready to launch an off-grid mini-grid uh, off mini uh, initiative with the Department of Energy as well. Um, you've got the U.S. Department of Agriculture, which works with uh, rural electrification. Um, you've got the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. You've got, um, and you've got the Department of Transportation. And even I've been learning as I go forward, because what you've seen historically is a lot of the, the U.S. government agencies, you all have our programs, and we all kind of don't, don't always speak to one another. There was something that came out recently about uh, a study from the GAO that looked at, 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 at renewable energy programs, that there were like 60-some-odd different renewable energy programs that different agencies had, and most of them weren't speaking to one another. The best thing that's coming out of Power Africa right now is the fact that we are coordinating with all of our other government counterparts, if not on a daily basis, at least on a weekly basis, there's a formal Power Africa working group that's based in Washington. But what we're doing, part of the model also, is in addition to the phone calls, and I have, I, if I check my emails right now, there's a chance that I'll have emails from people from six different agencies at any given moment, and I know that because I just checked. But we're speaking to each other daily. What we're trying to do is institutionalize this and have a one-stop shop where you have people who know how to work on these transactions located within one office, one in Washington, one in Nairobi, so that when people have innovative ideas and innovative solutions, where they're looking for investment opportunities, we're able to tell them all the things that the U.S. government is able to offer. So why are we focusing in these six countries? We have limited resources. We plan Power Africa with no new budget authority. Usually the budget process that the U.S. government would plan years in advance. You go to Congress, you ask them for the money. You basically took existing funds that we had and we, we tried to reprogram it, refocus it, and try to collaborate in different ways. So, so we're actually being very successful, and I say taking sort of getting, getting, you know, taking blood from a, from a stone or whatever the expression is. But, but we're basically we're, 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 we're being very successful and already shown impact. Let me share with you some of the things that we've done so far. Like I said, I'm here to be very transparent with you, and I want you to criticize me and ask me the tough questions. About 30 days before launch, we were asked by the head of our agency to go out to the private sector and get investments, get commitments from the private sector. And I said, who is going to give us these commitments right away without really knowing a lot about what Power Africa is all about and what we're going to be delivering on? And in 30 days, we got about $14 billion in private sector commitments. What that means is that ranges from a bank saying we're going to make X billions of dollars available for lending in the sector. Sometimes it's a company saying we're going to invest in these countries in the sector, and those are some of the big companies. It's some other smaller companies that have heard about it and they are taking advantage of our tools. But the private sector is excited about this. So let me tell you what it's not. President Obama announced seven billion dollars. When he announced the seven billion dollars, a lot of us said. Where's the seven billion dollars? Five billion of that seven billion dollars is export import bank financing. And that means US companies looking to sell products overseas for the most part. 
$1.5 million is from the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, OPIC Finance. That leaves you of the $7 billion with about $500 million for a major initiative that's going to double the number of people who have access to electricity in Sub-Saharan Africa. I'm wondering, so how are you going to do that? So you have USAID, which has our traditional grant mechanisms, and what we're doing is we're putting transaction advisors on the ground in each country whose jobs are to be like investment bankers. They're supposed to live and breathe these transactions. They're supposed to tell us at any given moment whose inbox this action is in. And this is what we've been doing. In, in Kenya, there's a, a 60 megawatt wind deal that just closed. And we've been tracking it closely. And we were trying to find out, all right, where is the next piece to make sure that this thing moves forward? We found out that the Attorney General had to approve some, some documentation as a condition precedent. We back channeled to someone who worked for the Attorney General. We had the ambassador meet with the Attorney General. We met with the, the, with the, with the developer to find out what do we need to do to move this forward. We got assurances that it's going to move forward and everything's been working out fine. And that's what we're doing. We're looking to figure out how can we help the private sector move forward because having the U.S. government go in and build things out, it's not sustainable for the most part. And it's not, uh, it's not we, don't, we simply just don't have the resources to do it. The private sector needs to be able to do this work and let the public sector focus on things like roads and schools and other things because they simply they have the resources to do this, but the development model has shifted right now. So we are not going in with the traditional model we see with other countries and doing the construction, but we're trying to figure out where are the market imperfections, where can we leverage the investments from the private sector, where can we collaborate with other donors. The US government doesn't have to be the big donor. So for example, the Sustainable Energy Fund for Africa, which focuses on small and mid-sized renewable deals. The US government's putting $5 million into that. The Danish government's putting $50 million into that. And someone said, when, and when we were making an announcement, we wanted to announce $10 million. And I said, well, technically we can, because Congress hasn't said it's okay. And someone said, well, no one's going to be, you know, no one's going to care about $5 million. And I said, it doesn't matter. The idea is that we're contributing to it. We don't have to be in the lead on everything, and we're collaborating. So the U.S. government doesn't have to be on the lead. We're trying to figure out in the area of geothermal, government uh, uh, donor collaboration right now in the area of geothermal is absolutely terrible, and the countries pay their you know play the donors off one another. We support. We work with the um, African Union's geothermal um, risk mitigation facility, and they just um, issued their first. We're getting ready to issue their first grants. And for those of you who know about geothermal, one of the, mo the upfront costs are among the most expensive costs. Geothermal is really inexpensive once you find that hot spot, but, but until you find that, every miss can cost you $3 million or $5 million. So is it the best use of our limited resources to help offset those costs? We need to figure out how we work with other donors to figure out how to, how to, how to mitigate those risks. So I just wanted to give you a general flavor of how it works and what we've been seeing to date. The last thing, I'll go back to Ethiopia. So one of the successes that we've seen, about a week and a half ago, the Prime Minister of Ethiopia signed a, it's called a head of terms with a company called Wycliffe like Geothermal, which is a US and Icelandic company, to build out 1,000 megawatts of geothermal uh, in Ethiopia. And this is significant for several reasons. One, this is the first independent power producer that will exist in Ethiopia. So that's transformational. And that's what Power Africa is about, because if we play a role in making that happen, we don't have to play the role in the next deal, because the market will now see that this is open for business. But also Ethiopia is focused, on, focused heavily on hydro, and now they're going to be focusing more and more on geothermal as well. And they recognize the importance of having that mix, and they're recognizing the incredible potential that they have. And it's also driving all the donor community and the government of Ethiopia and everyone to work together to figure out what the solutions are. We're interested in building the capacity of the governments themselves. When I compare our model, I mean, it's surprising because you hear about other governments that will come in and they'll just build things for the governments and you think this is what they want. The responses that we've received from the host governments from the private sector have been overwhelmingly positive. Because often that great deal that seems like a great deal when another government does that for you, I compare it to kind of being sold a timeshare. It seems like a great deal at the time, and a year later, you're looking back at the term and saying, maybe that really wasn't the best thing. You're trying to figure out how you get out of that or how you, how you, you know, how you can pass that on. 
what we're really focusing on is having the government in these countries push through the necessary reforms, because this is what they need to do to make these transactions come online, and own the deals themselves. But also building the capacity by working with them and finding out who are the people that are going to be negotiating the power purchasing agreements. And how can we make sure that those people get the training that they need? And how can we make sure that they're going to be able to carry these deals? And now I turn it over to you. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm really interested in hearing the comments that you have, hearing your opinions as to how you would implement Power Africa. You were advising us, hearing some of the ideas that you have about how to move power forward in Africa. So I guess I'll turn it to you. You're not the moderator. This is the moderator. <laughs> you're doing a great job. <laughs> um, and let, me, let me just um, ask the forbearance of the organizers in the modifying program to enable us to skip me along with that one and go straight to you because we, we, we really are, you know, we just have the day to get everyone asking lots of questions. We've learned a lot, but we'd love to hear what you think and, and have to say about these things. And, and so I just, I hope we can go straight to questions. Um, I wonder, I had a question of you, actually, uh, along with Alan's career. It's related, and I just wonder how many people have thought about working for U.S. government agencies in the context of, of energy? I do want to say that the uh, our senior energy advisor who is about to, he's currently in Afghanistan, but the first time I've a senior energy advisor in Nairobi, is a graduate of MIT and of, of, of MIT as well. So, are there any questions? Yeah, Doug. Hey, thanks for uh, telling us about your program. Um, one of the things I was interested in was, uh, it sounds like one of the major emphases is on uh, trying to create opportunities for U.S. businesses. I was wondering, like in practice, if there's tension between uh, that goal and trying to identify the best available solution for the U.S. And if there is tension, then how does that get worked out? Okay. So, there's a lot of tension, not just in this. This is one of the great things. We have 12 different agencies that have 12 different mandates. There are all kinds of policy tension that arise. And I'm really, I'm, you know, I'm a masochist, I guess, because I'm really enjoying this, because it's forcing the U.S. government to talk about it and we recognize that we're not always going to have a solution. But in terms of, of creating opportunities for U.S. business, you know, there's absolutely really no tension, because of the $14 billion private sector invest, uh, private sector companies we got, I'd say there are, I think, 34 original sort of founding partner companies. I mean, that's kind of the U.S. companies, the U.S. organizations. So one of the nice things about having 12 different agencies doing it, so USAID is not required to work with local businesses. In fact, our loan guarantee programs are usually for local businesses. OPIC's loan guarantee programs have a 25% U.S. equity interest in order to make the investment. But what we're seeing happen is there are U.S. companies that are now partnering with Nigerian companies more and more to create the benefits for both of them. So the Nigerian company is able to get financing just by bringing on that U.S. partner. And then the U.S. partner also is creating jobs in the United States as well. But obviously, so, so to talk about other sort of tension, this is going to come up. And Alan actually wrote a great policy piece on this that we had to like keep under wraps for a while. Because in Tanzania, as we were getting ready to launch Power Africa, we were so excited to be able to launch a, 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 a deal. And one of these deals was basically that we were pushing was based on an unsolicited proposal, which meant you know, no competition. And we had people, so Millennium Challenge Corporation has been working in Tanzania for a few years, and one of the key principles of what they're pushing is that you need to have full and open competition by the end of the So people were pushing back on us. And and we, so we had to figure out, well, how do you deal with this? Because in the, in the United States, we've had unsolicited proposals as well. And so he drafted a policy piece that we shared with the interagency that, that sort of guided us. It's not going to satisfy everyone. But it's looking at, all right, is it okay to have unsolicited proposals if it's done in a transparent way and there are transparent procedures? Because that's what we generally have in the United States as well. 
So we have to look at all these policy tensions and not always pick a hard line and everything and try to figure out what overall is the best. The other area has been sort of, you know, we've talked about a little bit and we don't have an answer one way or the other. I think the President Obama addressed this when he announced it is engagement with China. Um, are we competing with China? I don't think any of us views as competing with China. Are we going to work with China? Will we work with China side by side on a deal? Possibly. I mean, we have to look at each transaction and look at the level of transparency. Because at the end of the day, our goal is to double the amount of electricity that's available in Sub-Saharan Africa. And then I said, if all it takes is President Obama opening his mouth and saying that he wants to do this, if that's all it takes to motivate the government of China or the government of France, or private sector from anywhere in the world or within Africa to make the investments that they otherwise might have been afraid to make, the President Obama is going to achieve that goal. I'll, I'll just add to that that I, in the memo that I did to guide the policy on competitive versus non-competitive transactions, I said that competition is preferable in most or in many circumstances, but there are also conditions where it's not feasible or where there are no bidders. And in those situations, what we want to do is encourage an open book negotiation that is a transparent, uh, fully open analysis of the returns and the efficiency and so forth of the bid that's being offered. I have been set up here. <laughs> a couple of questions. One is a uh, scale. And I think you have alluded to it. Uh, USAID used to do roads in Africa. China is doing roads in Africa. There's actually no difference except the scale. China is doing exactly what the USAID used to do, but it's doing it at a scale that appears to make a difference. I wanted to hear your comments on how to find the scale. Because I, I didn't get a feel that uh, what you are doing is radically different from what may have happened without the information. And the only difference is that we are getting the US side of the government. My second question has to do with the uh, uh, capabilities. Again, I didn't hear you say anything about uh, local governments, because you know, these are transaction issues where we know African countries have had challenges in the past. Uh, to what extent are these initiatives? going to build up the capacity so that but down the line we don't have the same questions in that question. So on the issue of scale, the world's a completely different place than, than what it was 20 years ago. And the resources that are available to the government who are the, the countries who are working are completely different right now. So the amount of money that's spent on foreign assistance as a percentage of GDP in almost all the countries is really insignificant, with the exception maybe of Liberia, but it's really especially a country like Nigeria. I mean, for, to look at what we would have done 20 years ago, but what we've learned over the years from USAID is giving grants is not always the best solution. In fact, it's often the wrong solution, especially when you're entering into an industry that actually is profitable and bankable, and you can actually end up distorting the market. And this is, again, one of the concerns I've raised just based on my initial observations in Liberia because of all the donor funding going in there and doesn't sort of skew things too much, prevent, make the, make the free market way less sustainable. On issues of roads and things like that, um, you know, USAID, I mean, every now and then we will build roads and we've done that in Afghanistan and other places like that. But generally, in the country we're working, if we feel that there's a sufficient government revenue stream, we'll look for the government to be providing the services. But if they need to have technical Assistance and technical expertise to do that, we would try to provide the technical expertise. In the energy sector, we see the same thing. We see that the role really is for the private sector. Take it up here. The, the private sector is willing to make the investments and there's a profit motive for them to do it, whether it's a U.S. company. And I want to emphasize it's not going to be a U.S. company a lot of the time. And we're not necessarily advocating for U.S. companies, but we see that the role of the private sector can be doing this. In terms of um, the second question of the capacity building government, 
that's exactly what, are you talking about the local governments or are you talking about the, the, the national governments? You just mean the, the host government mm -hmm. so that is the, That is the key focus of what we're doing. No, so the key, the key focus of what we're doing. So a key, so when I talk about the Power Africa model, it's the transaction advisors, but it's also creating delivery units within the government. And delivery units are basically people who are usually housed within the president's office, the prime minister's office, a key ministry. And these are people who are tasked with pushing through significant major reform. And it's a model that, that, that Tony Blair used in his administration. Malaysia's been using it. And now President Kikwete, who has big results now in Tanzania, has created these delivery labs and figuring out what does he need to do to get the big results now. The USAID, along with other donors, are buying into President Kikwete's delivery lab and delivery units. And we're, our focus is on the energy sector. We're embedding advisors within the ministries. And so in Tanzania is another example where we're putting one advisor who's embedded within the Rural Energy Agency, and putting another advisor in, in, in a different ministry here as well. And then we look at other things like gas supply issues. It's one thing to build out the generation of gas in, in Nigeria and Ghana and Tanzania, but if you can't guess, get the supply, get the gas to the generation, it's not going to do you any good. So we have a lot of people who are looking at issues and doing analyses and recommending we need to get a gas advisor in there. So this is very much focused on actually building the capacity of the local governments by getting them the type of assistance that they request. So Tanzania, even though we suggest, hey, we want to send an advisor that we're not going to do anything unless the government of Tanzania says, this is what we want. Very similar to Ghana as well. The government of Ghana, they know about this delivery unit concept, but they say they've got their own view of how this should work. So we're trying to figure out how we can support the government of Ghana to achieve the goals that they want. And we'll offer advice that they can take it. And I'll, I'll give another example of building local capacity. Imagine Nigeria with a, an unbundled national electricity company that has 45, 50% losses. I mean, they're just hemorrhaging money. Every kilowatt hour that goes in, you lose half of the, the revenues on that. The regulator has to set tariffs for a transitional period. How do you set tariffs for a transitional period where you're starting out with losses that are sky high and you hope the losses will drop to 12, 15% at the end of a transition period. But what, what we did was two things. One, we worked with the regulator on public relations. How can they talk to the public about what's going to happen with tariffs? How to explain the transition period and that tariffs are not going to go through the roof because they're going to be fixed on a transitional uh, fixed tariff basis. And the second thing we've been doing is as the regulator is approaching this transition period where the private operators take over the distribution companies, the regulator is asking how do we make adjustments in the tariffs as the conditions emerge, the, the real data comes out, as the power supply is less than we had expected, you know, as the conditions are different from what we set the fixed tariff at. And what we're doing is providing some advisors to the regulator to say, here are some options for adjusting the tariff as you go through this five-year transition period. So we're, we're not setting the tariffs. We're giving them options. We're working through ideas. We're helping them to do modeling. But they're, they're doing all the tariff setting work there. <laughs> I wanted to wait to answer your question. Hi, I'm Amy Rose. I had a comment or a question, I guess, related to rural electrification. You mentioned there was the off-grid challenge that's been launched and then a new thing that's about launching microgrids that may result in innovative business models and technologies. But my understanding is a lot of the challenge for private companies and microgrids is that there's a lot of uncertainty among customers as to when the grid might come to their village and whether or not they should invest in, in maybe a solar home system. And so I was wondering if you thought about working with the government maybe to send clearer signals about their plans for rural electrification so that private microgrid companies can know the size of the market and how long it's expected to last. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Amy. Um, in fact, I don't think we were thinking about it until we had to 
discussions with you and your team here. Um, I, I've seen projects in the past where a, a private developer will step in and supply power when the government can't uh, supply it from the national grid. Uh, and in, in fact, Iraq was a famous case where all these small diesel operators stepped in because the national grid couldn't supply more than two or three hours a day. And what happens is, is as soon as the government comes in there with their three cent power, the 15 cent power diesel operator in the case of, of uh, Iraq or Afghanistan is pushed aside. They lose all of their customers and they're facing a lot of uncertainty. Um, Ignacio has talked to us a bit about the, uh, the kind of regulatory framework that can be evolved to provide sufficient certainty that investors can make a commitment. And I, although we haven't talked in detail, and I look forward to further discussion of this, I'm assuming that it's not a commitment of 25 years of being locked into 15 or 20 cent per kilowatt hour energy when you could buy 10 cent but that there's reasonable certainty. It's a five-year commitment, or it's integrated with the planning process so that the planners say, this town is being served for the next seven years. The private providers have a, a license to operate there for that period of time. And I think it's something that we probably need to think about in our program. So that was one of the productive outcomes of our discussions today. Uh, a couple of months ago, uh, I was, was working at the uh, Natural Gas Company in Nigeria, so I'm pretty much familiar with what's good in Nigeria, for example, as, as a case study. Uh, I'm, I'm quite excited about the Power Africa project, um, but not so much about the, the, the money at stake, because uh, I don't know if you're aware, uh, about one to two years ago, there was you know, some sort of power project in Nigeria that the government initiated and eventually a scam about 16 billion dollars. You know. So, well, I mean, I'm excited about the money that, that is being made available for this project. And it's still, I personally believe as an African that that money itself is available within Africa. So, I don't think the challenges that we're facing or that we've been facing for so many years really has so much to do about the money or even the expertise. Uh, because the company that I worked with uh, was, was a natural gas company that was focused on exports. But because there was no power available you know, in the country, we had to generate our own power using you know, gas turbines supplied by General Electric, General Electric. We did one single company on one side, we did up to 50 megawatts of power. And uh, because we couldn't use all the power that we were generating, we actually export, not exporting, sending out some of the power to the community. So the community had power 24-7, we weren't getting paid anything for it. It was basically compensation responsibility. So if one company could do that, then it shouldn't be hard for the country to do that. So, but my question is, how do you intend to address the fundamental issues that have prevented these problems from being you know, solved? Um, you're bringing in a lot of stakeholders with different interests, competing interests, some just want to make money, some, I mean, U.S. aid definitely is interested in development, not just so much of, of the money that the profits that are made, made out of it. How, how will you ensure this injury is successful? Um, just to put a little bit of context also, what I'm saying all of this is uh, that there's a really, really good debt aid and how you know, in the past 50 years we've had about $1 trillion of aid coming to Africa. And I pretty much agree with what you said, aid really has killed Africa to a very large extent. You know, Africa is going to develop from inside out. How are you going to get this, how, how will this project really be implemented in such a way that the value, the real value that you want to deliver to the, to the poor African is right there? How are you going to do in such a way that African will actually get value from this? And not just the companies that start to benefit from this, or the numerous stakeholders that have one, one interest or the other. Thank you. So, so a couple of things. One, um, thanks for your comment. It's great to hear from people who actually have the experience and have worked within the companies and in the country who are working. So the end of perspective is fantastic. On, on the governance issue, which I assume you're getting at, corruption, that was one of my first questions before I joined this, is, well, how are we doing this? Isn't there just a ton of corruption there? And, how are we going to make this happen? And, and really, that, that, that continues to be a concern. What I can tell you is that we do fairly thorough due diligence on every project that we work on. And, and we look at the, the agencies follow the normal due diligence processes and look into all the principles and they do financial due diligence as well as non-financial due diligence. But we've also created our own because we have to worry about 
reputational harm for the White House as well. It's tough enough for the President and Buchanan and you know, for him to get criticized for a uh, U.S. government investment in a company that goes bankrupt in the United States. But for the President to suddenly be back in the initiative and there's a, there, there's a company that we're working with that, that, that has all kinds of issues, for whatever reason that could be skewed politically, and that investment is going overseas, that is basically political suicide for, for the President. So, we really have a responsibility to prevent reputation on not to our president, but the U.S. government as a whole. So we do look at that. And corruption does remain an issue. So one of the things we're looking at are basic power Africa policy principles. And, um, and amongst those, those principles would be transparency and like corruption. And also one of the things the U.S. government does well and not so well, and we get criticized for it, but people also like us to do it, even though they don't say it publicly is we're often the ones that do the arm twisting and break the bad news and take the hard line. So when there's a, you know, what happens, I was talking to colleagues about this today, when you're living in a country, if you're part of an embassy or a donor, or you're, if you're just living in the country as a business, you're often apologizing for the minister or the person that you're doing with, because you're trying to continue to build that relationship. And you're not always going to, if you give you know, lending, there's a conditionality on that, and they don't meet all the conditions, but you know that your job or something else is going to depend on the next tranche of money that comes in, you're going to make excuses for the people, and you're going to look over that. And I very much do not believe in that. And I've had people from other agencies and multilateral banks say to me, hey, I really hope that you're going to insist that they meet the conditions that are necessary. So at least for me, I, I'll take a very hard line. And, in fact, I've already met with one government, and I've talked with the minister, and I said, I'll be the first person to write the cable, and if it has to be a dissent cable, which means that the ambassador or whatever doesn't agree with me, I'm going to cost you my job because you're not doing what you're hard to do, I'll do that. Because Power Africa has to mean something. To be a Power Africa country has to mean something, not just on the U.S. side, but on the post-government side. The point is, is that the governments are willing to make the difficult commitments. You know, the government is not willing to move forward and make the commitments that they've agreed to make. I'll also be the first person to recommend that we pull the plug on that country and move on to the next country because there are many countries in Sub-Saharan Africa that want to be part of this initiative because they see the benefits. At a minimum, it's a stamp of approval from the U.S. government saying this is a good place to do business. And it's difficult to attach a dollar value to that, but everybody knows that there's a lot of value to that. So, this is a good place to do business. And you're going to get the support from the U.S. government. And for the first time, so we heard this from the private sector, that all of a sudden the economic officers at the embassy are taking their call, at, at, at the embassy are taking their calls and, 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 and making calls on their behalf. So people are already seeing the benefits. So let me give the Nigeria example. It's actually a really good case. Nigeria had a bankrupt integrated parastatal for how many generations? Two generations. Like that. Um, it, it was it was globally famous for bad service, for, for a few hours per day of unpredictable service and for leakage of money and for projects that went off the rails and so forth. And it was just a poster child for why Africa doesn't have power. Are you old enough to remember the former name of this interview? <laughs> what what was the former name? Short for never expect power again. <laughs> power again. Yeah, so, so the government decided uh, in about 12 years ago that the situation was intolerable. At the same time, they undertook that $16 billion program that you referred to, the NIPT. Uh, that was to construct some large power plants and some distribution and transmission associated with some new parastatal power plants. But the government decided that they were not running the power sector properly. They needed to get out, they needed to privatize it, they needed to create a market. And what they wanted to do, and Ignacio I think would be would find this really interesting, they wanted to create a five-year transitional market with a bulk trader as an intermediary between the generators and the distributors that would manage the transition from losses because the collections of the discos were too small in that uh, early stages of that period. And so the government set up a regulatory agency, which we helped to, to establish, 
They set up the bulk trader, which we also advised, along with the Canadians and the UK government. Uh, but these are Nigerian entities. They're not donor creations. They're Nigerians who run them. They're great technical people. Uh, the government designed the terms of the privatization transaction. They explained it to the potential bidders and the public. And then on the date, near the date that they said they would do it, they put up an RFP saying, who wants to buy 11 distribution companies? Troubled as they are, they have fixed tariffs for a five-year transition period. You bid the losses that you will reduce over the five-year period. So they're bidding the losses with a fixed tariff rate. It would actually be a really good case for uh, your energy economics uh, classes to study because it, it's working, it's a very innovative uh, approach, uh, and it got great bids for the 11 distribution companies and five generation companies. They got $2.35 billion worth of investment commitments to buy the equity of the company. That's just 60% of the equity. Now this is a good example of what Power Africa is trying to do. This is an indigenous government of Nigeria commitment. The Minister of Power and the Minister of Finance has said to our senior officials, our highest commitment in the energy sector today is making this transition work. That's what we, the Nigerians, want. And what we've said is, okay, we'll help you. We're not gonna give you hundreds of millions of dollars, we'll give you few million dollars to try to ensure the bulk trader works properly, the regulator can keep up with the dynamism of the market, and we just ran an interesting um, workshop in Lagos on distribution automation and smart grids for distribution, partly in order to, to help people look forward at their investments in the distribution sector but we had U.S. companies involved in delivering the training so that they could meet some of the Nigerian investors, get a sense of what was going on there. So that, that's how we're trying to address this, a situation as you experience. Now you see why I brought Alan with me. We're going to play a new game. It's called Stump Alan. So you can, you can ask a question that doesn't know the answer to. Hello there. Hi. My name is Melissa Seba. I'm actually a graduate student of our Harvard Business School of Market Kansas. So it's uh, infiltrating at my feet. <laughs> um, but uh, my question actually builds from Professor Jubas um, earlier. So you spoke a lot about the capacity building on the government side, in terms of manage the, manage the equipment, the regulation, and the policy. I wonder if you're doing anything with Power Africa to build the capacity on the private side, so effectively technology diffusion uh, when it comes to build the domestic um, firms. Is that an interest of Power Africa? In our, and if so, what have you been doing? That's not one of the key focuses because one of the things that's what I tell people that the U.S. is, is great at is where we have innovation in the private sector is basically pursuing doing the technology themselves. But at the same time, we do have 12 different agencies involved, including the, the Department of Energy. And even USAID, I did through our um, HESM, the Higher Education, uh, we, have, we have two. Uh, this is those I'll tell you. You guys, <laughs> I got it in my notes. No, it's a higher, it's an HESN program. We have two of them at MIT right now. And, and one of those things is looking at sort of, it is looking at developing different types of technology. But the big money for new technology usually comes from the Department of Defense, Department of Energy, and things like that. So that is part of Power Africa, but that's not sort of the heavy focus for, me, for overseas. One of the things that I love about one of the, it's the site program that, that MIT is going to be implementing. It's going to be putting together more like a consumer reports that will evaluate technologies like the solar lanterns and evaluating all of them and what works and what doesn't work and that. That's a fantastic tool because there's all kinds of products that come out and, and so, so the answer to your question is yes and no, but, but generally yes. Not in the way I think that you're looking for there because it was really resource constrained. The, the example that I gave of, of the training on smart distribution grids was for the privatized companies. And it was delivered with NAPTIN, the National Power Training Institute of Nigeria. So it was a, a USG collaboration with the GON agency, but it was for the private discos. Hi there. Uh, my name is Travis Sheehan. I'm an MIT alum and uh, district energy planner for the city of Boston now. And I have a nebulous question about your pool of capital and if you guys are building um, uh, credit 
like helping the local governments build their own credit, and if that capital pool that you had affected the lending capacity, or if you guys are just underwriting everything, or is that is it too nebulous of a question? No, I mean one of the things that we're looking at are sort of working with pension funds to issue bonds to invest in our credit. So, so I don't know if this is going to answer your question, but we're looking at all kinds of tools to figure out what we can do. Again, this builds local capacity. So you've got pension funds in a lot of these countries that are looking for investments to make sure quite encourage their investment both locally but also possibly regionally. So you get pension funds that can a pension fund out of South Africa that can suddenly invest in Nigeria. We're trying to work with some of them and try to within their world to figure out what sort of guarantees we provide on, on, on bonds that they need issue or, or so so there's all kinds of different types of credit pools that we're exploring. Um, using tools from USAID, from Accent, from the African Development Bank, from, from OPIC, from the World Bank. I don't know if that answers your question or not. I don't think I did. No, that, that was good. But I'm, I'm also just thinking, like, does, does the credit rating for the world government, I'm not sure if it's like a venture or a specific private development, that can affect that big picture and the types of capital funds you get through this project? I don't know answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you'll have a, a revolution. <laughs> you'll have a revolution. 
Now, now, Sarah, this gentleman behind you has been uh, raising a hand faithfully. Every hand is as low as you can. Maybe if you shout it out. I don't think there's a microphone. Oh, yeah. uh, I'll just want to First of all, very excited to hear about this. I'm hoping I'm a graduate student in health engineering at the school too. I'm hoping this will move to North Africa where I'm from, because there's a lot of very interesting things that can happen there, uh, especially at the moment. Keep on uh, hoping. Yeah. Some <laughs> center in Africa. It's a good try. That's thank you. Yeah. Uh, so I've worked on a number of transactions in production donors and energy in Egypt, and there are two questions that I have in mind, uh, and, and they sort of uh, have the same uh, source. Uh, energy the systems are the most politicized, heterogeneous, long-lasting systems ever. And you know, they're not the kind of things you want to plan in a two-year sort of period. You have to have a sort of a grand plan. There are two questions inside. One of them is about the choice of technology. A lot of the times there are just big technology that works in a certain place and needs to move into a new market. But that market isn't necessary, that's not the best technology for it. And one, one example I can think of is you know, for a few of different examples. If he has a number of different possibilities. Each has a number of different possibilities in which way to go to energy, nuclear, coal, etc. Who makes that decision? If the national governments don't have a national strategy, that's a 10, 15 years strategy, how does E how does for development, uh, how does the, the, the how Africa initially fit with these long term plans? The second question is most of the energy markets in developing countries are fundamentally research because the people who need the resource cannot afford to pay the real cost for it, and it's subsidized in one way or the other. And the decision to provide that energy in an unsubsidized way is, you know, has a huge political cost. Are these IPPs, will they, will they in the end sell international prices locally, or are they going to be subsidized by the government? How are these units structured like? So, so in terms of the choice of technology, this is one of the things that obviously is important to me. And I give you an example is Liberia. It's not clear to me we're the best place to invest in our private sector right now. 23 megawatts, not knowing, not knowing what impact when the Mountain Coffee hydro plant comes online and, and significantly adds to the grid, how that's going to impact the price. When also at the same time you've got the West Africa Power Pool that may be suddenly bringing transmission lines into Liberia. But then if you're looking at at trying to trying to invest in a biomass plant. In Liberia, you know that your costs are going to be 20 cents, 20 some odd cents a kilowatt hour, but the hydro will be at six cents a kilowatt hour, and the, the energy the transmission line might be might be eight cents a kilowatt hour. It's really difficult to predict what the costs are going to be, and it's going to prevent you from necessarily making your investment. That being said, there's still tons of people who want to invest, but it's surprising me. I'm just thinking, it's my money. I'm not an expert in the industry, so a lot of people they have a sense as to what they actually think will happen. They're, 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 they're taking into account all these risks. So going back to sort of the power, power after policy principle, one of those things is a master plan. And most of the countries we're working already have them. Liberia, there's a report that the World Bank, someone put on behalf of the World Bank just prepared, what they call the least cost development plan. It's about 300 pages long. And the government of Liberia is evaluating it right now, so whether or not they find it useful. But the goal is that for each of these countries, they will, in fact, have sort of a long-term strategic plan that takes into account the mix. And it's key to have the mix of the renewables and the non-renewables as well, because prices fluctuate, and then also taking into account on-grid and off-grid as well, and how long you can plan on on-grid. So I'll let you address the on-grid groups. Yeah. <laughs> um, the issue of planning what has been brought up in, in our discussions today, and I think the, the points that were raised by your colleagues here have been excellent. We, I think we need to think a little bit more about the planning context of, of what we're doing as we roll forward. On subsidies, um, I, I'm a neoclassically anti-subsidy uh, uh, energy economist. Um, what I found is that if you have a, a major hydrocarbon exporter, producer exporter, Qatar, for example, or UAE or Saudi Arabia, you can get away with subsidies for generations. Qatar subsidizes 63% of the cost of electricity and 73% of the cost of residential electricity. But you've got revenues to do that. Countries like Pakistan that have tried to play that game now spend five times as much 
on, elect on fuel subsidies as they spend on health and education combined. And one of the implications of that is if you think you're going to keep the population happy with, with low-cost electricity for generations, the, it probably is going to affect a couple of things. Human capital, your physical infrastructure, it's going to eat up your fiscal space. It has an opportunity cost on the export of those resources. And then when you get into the inflection point of your resource curve, like Egypt is with the gas, like Uzbekistan is with the gas, like Pakistan is with the gas, like Bangladesh is with the gas, then suddenly your subsidies have to be um, maintained with gas that you're importing. Or take Indonesia, which was a net oil exporter until about five years ago, and now they're a net oil importer. They're, they're consuming everything that they're producing in terms of oil. So I, you know, I just can't see an energy future in which subsidi subsidies are a principal driver of access. I can see subsidies that are targeted to a, to a very carefully defined uh, proportion of the population. Um, I can see subsidies for specific purposes to encourage renewables for a certain period of time. But most countries that have tried it for a long time, unless they're hydrocarbon exporters, have found that it really distorts things. I mean, it, am I too, too uh, <laughs> anti-subsidy? <laughs> but in the application, with these countries that are involved with power in Africa, do they sell them to have some system for subsidies? Uh, well, Nigeria is getting rid of subsidies except for the poor, for just a low tariff block. Uh, Ghana and Tanzania still think they can get away with it, but it's, that's why they can't sign IDP deals, because they have insolvent utilities. Kenya uh, went to targeted subsidies years ago. Uganda is doing the same thing through private participation. Very targeted subsidies just for a few classes of customers. So that, that's a general trend. Just a request for the questions. Could you go keep it to one question, please? Mm -hmm. Thank you. I promise to get back to you just later. Thank you. Uh, I'm Ken Louise. I'm from the D-Lab here at MIT. I actually work on the site program. Uh, yeah. I've been wanting to ask you for, uh, for that program. Actually, they presented their preliminary results to us yesterday on the solo event for comparison. It was very exciting. So there'll be more to come at the technical community if you're saying anything about that. But my question was so. We've done a lot of work, we also we do a lot of work in East Africa, but also in North Africa as well. And when we were in Morocco um, about six months ago, the grid had been extended pretty far into the rural areas, I mean, hours and hours out by car, um, which was pretty impressive um, given a lot of places that I had traveled before. Um, but it was incredibly expensive, um, and people were paying per month a lot more than I was paying in electricity. Um, and their incomes are significantly lower, obviously, than what we're making. So I'm just wondering, how do you, you know, accessibility is one issue, but affordability is another huge issue. So how do you ensure that you keep it affordable for people who don't have large incomes and can actually you know, afford to do this? I'll, I'll quickly say, and then I'll let Alan, Alan speak, since he's the more substantive of the two of us. But what I will say is, <laughs> Alan is a big fan of the, of the big grid, but as part of Power Africa, we are looking Solution. And in fact, I've, with some of my speakers, said even in the United States, we need to be looking at some of you know, looking at our grid in a different way. So, you know, smarter grid. Uh, read, read the World Bank report on renewable energy for uh, all of Sub-Saharan Africa. What they say is that for, and I'm not trying to be anti-small and distributed. Uh, generation. It, it, I think it's very important to decide where it is most suitable. But least cost generation applies in this world where we are today. It's an important concept today. It's important in renewables because some of our least cost generation resources are in areas where people don't live. And if, if we don't, if a country doesn't continue to discipline itself to go for those least cost resources rather than other, you know, alternatives, people are going to have to pay a lot to have cost recovery. Um, and I, I guess the second, um, the targeted subsidies are very useful, but there aren't many countries in the world that have heavily subsidized 
uh, rural electrification uh, unless they have a major revenue source such as hydrocarbons to maintain those subsidies. Um, what about the cross subsidies? What about one part of the market providing subsidies? Well, of course that works. Well-designed well subsidies are a reasonably good idea, and a lot of countries have innovative ways of providing subsidies, but you know, if you try to bring a, uh, electricity down to two cents a kilowatt hour to people, it's almost guaranteed that that market will be curtailed and attrited over time. So, I mean, I don't know if it was 20 cents a kilowatt hour, but if it was two cents, they probably won't have power five years from now. services you're providing are not exclusive to U.S. companies, so you welcome other companies from other countries to invest. So I wanted to bring up China, since you mentioned it. Um, you know, there are a lot of Chinese steel companies investing in infrastructure projects in China. Now. And I'm just wondering what you have envisioned for how that might happen when China needs power out there. Because you seem like you have a lot of conditions that you place, and you have a lot of U.S. government baggage behind it. There's all sorts of latent conflicts conflict between the US and China surrounding investment in Africa. But if the ultimate goal is to improve access and to provide lots of low-cost financing, maybe working more directly with the Chinese government in developing this program um, might be an alternative or additional for this, for this initiative. So I'm just wondering if you've had any discussions on this or what your long-term thinking is. So first, I wouldn't call it baggage. I would call it standards that we've got. <laughs> And that's we're holding anyone to the same standard whether you're a Chinese company or a US company, but a certain level of transparency that's important for us. Basically, we're, but we're basically, in most cases, we're not giving, direct, I mean, in some cases, we are giving direct grants to companies, for example, for US Trade Development Agency and OPEC have this um, Africa Clean Energy financing initiative. They're giving some startup development capital for certain projects. So, in that case, but they have very rigorous types of uh, due diligence they do. And they also have, their, their mandate is to support the U.S. They to work mostly with U.S. companies and U.S. investors. Um, so in, the, the, in terms of the, the values, the other things that the conflict, I mean, there's not a conflict in terms of what the Chinese are trying to do and what we're trying to do. I, I can never guess what their motives are their investments, they obviously, just like the U.S. government has, everyone always says, what are the real motives here? This is all about just creating jobs for Americans. My response is, so what? How's that job market out there for you guys? Is there something wrong with the U.S. government trying to create jobs for Americans? I'm not never going to apologize for that. I work for USAID. Our job generally is to create jobs for people in the country who are working. And I love the fact that I'm also with the Department of Commerce looking for ways to create jobs for Americans. But I'm also well. And in terms of the conflict with the Chinese, um, it's come up already. So we're, we're, we have an advisor that we're embedding at the Rural Energy Association, uh, Rural Energy Agency in Tanzania. And one of the deals that they could be end up working on could be a deal that the Chinese have a lead on. And the question has come up, well, can you tell the person not to work on that deal? We haven't figured that out yet. The person hasn't been asked to work on that deal, but I can tell you that once the person is asked to work on that deal, we'll have that conversation. And there'll probably be disagreements amongst the people on the table. We don't even agree within our own agencies often. I mean, you can see that I we don't agree on everything. Well, that's what's fantastic about this, is that we're having the conversations, we're trying to reach consensus as much as possible. The question of the Inga Dam, I don't know how many of you know, the, raise your hands if you know what the Inga Dam is. Okay. So for those of you, read about the Inga Dam. The Inga Dam is potentially like putting a man on the moon. And it has the potential to provide electricity that for most of the people in all of Sub-Saharan Africa if it were to come online. It's 80 gigawatts of electricity. And it's located in the Democratic Republic of Congo. That's the issue. But you've got the president of the World Bank who's very excited about this. You've got several people high level with the US government who are excited about this. You've got people within agencies who are questioning, well, should we be looking at trying to participate in bringing on Grand Inga? It's not new. It's been around for more than 40, 50 years, something like that. People have known about the potential for Grand Inga. It would be the largest dam project in the world. And, and the government, uh, the DRC, is 
we have before on this, but we're having conversations. The Chinese are one of the consortia that have been sort of pre-selected to be in the three, which is we do this phase one for the dam. The head of my agency had a conversation with a high-level Chinese official the other day saying, all right, is there an opportunity for us to collaborate? But if we're going to collaborate, they're going to have to be certain standards. Hi, uh, yeah, uh, my name is Scott Berger. I'm a first year at TPP student. Uh, I'm curious, you kind of touched on this earlier with transitional uh, tariff setting for utilities. Um, and you, you mentioned that you're not a fan of energy subsidies, and I uh, very much agree with that. But how do you deal with setting the correct, sub or the correct tariff level such that you can provide sufficient incentive for investment, but also provide enough uh, enough of a market where the, the people in those countries are uh, capable of, of paying such that you actually create a market so that you can incentivize investment. It seems like you could kind of build a cycle of failure. Ignacio is our resident expert on that. It's a complicated question, um, and particularly in the context of the Nigerian transaction. So maybe I'll catch you on the way out. Or I, I think it's probably too complicated for this discussion. Are we at a point where it's one more question? Yeah. Thank you. My name is Jane. I'm a graduate student at the Fletcher School at Tufts University. And it seems to me what you're doing is really great work in Africa. But the question I have is, are you, are you trying to get involved in everything? Uh, and that's from our generation to, to transmission, anything that touches energy. Okay. Um, how do you, it seems like a very cumbersome strategy. Um, what, what would your focus or preference be if you could focus or zone in on one thing? Um, for example, in, in Nigeria, I think, uh, oh. <laughs> I, I think um, the natural gas being cleared off right now it's, it makes it an easy kind of go-to thing to co-locate uh, power generation um, facilities there. But, um, Obviously, you can't do that in the other countries that you have. So, so you do natural gas in Nigeria, and you can go to nuclear plants somewhere else, and coal factory here, some windows there. That's doing a lot. So, so we're not doing nuclear, and we're not doing coal. I'll start with that. But I agree with you. And in fact, every time another country comes, they, they want to do power off the country as well. It's, 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 we've already bitten off more than we can do in the resources that we have. And let's try to show results and have an impact right now. You know, the areas that we're generally working on are renewables and wind, geothermal, solar, hydro, we're doing some gas. We recognize the issue of gas clearing in Nigeria is a significant one, so we do projects to capture some of that. But we're trying, that's why we're really trying to have what we're doing in Nairobi is we're, we're creating an institutional support contract there that will be staffed with experts. You can get on a plane an hour and a half be in Addis Ababa, or an hour be in Dar, or in five hours be in Lagos, and provide experts in a wide variety of areas so that we can be responsive to the very diverse needs of Power Africa. If I were to focus on distribution, transmission, and generation, I'll let Alan answer that because I've heard a lot of different views on that. I'm sure you've got stronger biases than I have in that respect. But keep in mind that, that we're working closely with the World Bank as well. We're working closely with other, with other donors, and some of them are focusing in particular areas. So what we'll try to do is, as we find a certain donor or a certain partner that is focusing more and more in a certain area, we may back off of that and then try to figure out how we can focus our research. Well, I'll just mention that the, the World Bank did find in their review of African electricity that uh, most African countries have tariffs that are set too low in the efficiency of the distribution companies is not good. The collections are not sufficient. And that tends to be a natural constraint on building new generation. If you build new generation, you have to be able to pay for it. If you lose 50% of every unit that you generate, you're not going to build a lot of generation. So our Africa has a stronger focus at this point in time on generation. If uh, Ghana or Tanzania were to say we want to privatize uh, Tenesco or we want to have a concession for a piece of the Ghanaian system. Or as the, the Nigerians said, 
number of years ago, we want to privatize the entire sector except for transmission. I, I suppose Power Africa might have a role. I'm, in I'm, I'm intrigued after, so I, I got out to Nairobi in August, and I made it a point to go out to each of the countries and just get my first general, you know, dangerous amount of knowledge you know, there. And I was really intrigued by the West Africa Power Pool. So one of the meetings we're having tomorrow is to actually talk about regional trade and electricity. I, I hadn't been focusing on that a lot before. I didn't want to focus on that more. Sarah, we're well, turning control back to you. Yeah. So I just want, if you guys could please help us um, thank Alan and Andy. I want to just say thank you so much to the E4Dev team. Uh, so Kareen, who's not here tonight, Andy, Zach, Lily, uh, my co-partner in crime at Ale, she's awesome, and also to Yemi, who volunteered tonight to help us out, to all of our other volunteers, we want to say thank you so much. Um, E4Dev is taking a break um, next week, but please, uh, if you are not on our email list, sign up. Um, our next event will be on Thursday, October 31st, okay? So thank you all so much for coming out.